I'm sure most of you are aware of who Charles Manson is and his role in those gruesome murders, but some of you may not know he released his debut album while in jail in March of 1970. But what's even crazier to me is that there exists a whole other album that he recorded with the Beach Boys at Brian Wilson's home studio, and this has yet to see the light of day. How was this possible? Why did it come to be? And what happened to the tapes? In this episode of Strange and Unusual Tales, we will uncover the answers to these questions. This is the story of the Lost Beach Boys' Charles Manson album. Today's episode is brought to you by Surfshark. Okay, so when talking about the Beach Boys, surfing naturally comes to mind, which then makes me think about surfing the web. And okay, <laughs> I know that was a cheesy segue. But what's not cheesy is protecting your information online, and that's where Surfshark comes in. Surfshark creates a virtual private network, or VPN, which prevents your ISP from seeing your browsing activity. It also masks your IP address, making it much harder for companies to track you and collect your data. With Surfshark, you can also change your location on the fly to gain access to geo-restricted content on streaming services and other websites. Plus, Surfshark works across all your devices with one account, so you'll be protected no matter where you're browsing. Right now, you can directly support the channel and get 83% off plus three extra months for free when you sign up today. Just follow the link below and use the code VINYL at checkout. And Surfshark has a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if it's not a great fit, no worries. That's 83% off plus three extra months for free. Just use the link below and be sure to type in the code VINYL at checkout. So I want to preface this video by saying information on this lost album is very scarce. For obvious reasons, most people in or connected to the Beach Boys want to distance themselves from the whole affair, and Charles's own biography is rather incoherent and should be taken with a grain of salt. What we do know is that Charles Manson got involved with the Beach Boys through their drummer, Dennis Wilson. Now, there are several accounts of how they first met. One involves Dennis getting picked up by an associate of Charles while hitchhiking, and yet Charles himself stated that he first met Dennis in San Francisco. However, the most likely story is that one day in April of 1968, Dennis picked up two women hitchhiking, and he brought them back to his newly rented home at 14400 Sunset Boulevard. For Dennis, he was always the most reckless and adventurous member of the Beach Boys, and being newly divorced, it was often the case he would bring home young Young women. However, this time, something was different. The women told Dennis about Charles Manson, describing him as a musician, poet, and leader of their group, later known as the family. At some point, Dennis left the women at the house, and he went to Brian Wilson's house for a recording session. When he came back to his house around 3 in the morning, he found it full of people, and this is most likely when Dennis first met Charles. He was drawn to Charles' charismatic personality and his reputation as a folk singer and songwriter. A friendship soon developed between the two men that was mutually beneficial. Manson was eager to use Dennis's connections to further his music career, and Dennis took full advantage of Manson's ability to bring young women to the house and partake in the psychedelic drug-fueled sex orgies. Soon after meeting, Charles and roughly two dozen members of his family took up residence at Dennis's home for about five months. During that time, the family exploited Dennis's hospitality, running errands in his cars, eating his food, selling or giving away his possessions, wearing his clothes, having wild parties, and Dennis seemed to enjoy it all, at least for a time. According to the book Dennis Wilson, The Real Beach Boy, Dennis felt a lot of guilt over becoming rich at such a young age, to the point where he actively gave away a lot of his money to his friends, and so I think it's safe to say he probably enjoyed sharing his wealth with Charles and his followers. In 1971, an anonymous member of the Beach Boys told Rolling Stone magazine, I suppose the lifestyle appealed to him. Dennis ran up the largest gonorrhea bill in history the time the whole family got the clap. Dennis's mother, Audrey Wilson, said, They were just hippies, and he, Dennis, thought Manson was the nicest person, a very gentle, nice guy. I did think they were a bunch of leeches. After the release of Pet Sounds in 1966, the Beach Boys' creative driving force, Brian Wilson, started to experience a period of emotional stress and erratic behavior. His songwriting output slowed significantly, and by the summer of 1968, Brian found himself in a psychiatric hospital seeking treatment. On top of this, their popularity as a band had reached its lowest level, and they were generally seen as uncool. They were also facing mounting debt, and they had a fast-approaching deadline of delivering 
releasing one last album to fulfill their contract with Capitol Records. So with Brian out of the picture, the rest of the band were stuck picking up the reins either by finishing songs Brian started or writing new songs themselves. Dennis was a gifted songwriter, however, he struggled with writing lyrics, but this was something that Charles had a gift for. Neil Young said, Manson would sing a song and just make it up as he went along for three or four minutes and he would never repeat one word and it all made perfect sense and it shook you up to listen to it. It was so good that it scared you. He had this kind of music that nobody else was doing. I thought he really had something crazy, something great. He was like a living poet. I think Dennis admired Charles's musical talent and wanted to help him be heard. And so sometime during the summer of 68, Dennis arranged for Charles to start recording some of his songs at Brian Wilson's home studio. According to Charles, he recorded about 10 songs and they were very well produced, with some members of the Beach Boys playing on the tracks and some of his female followers singing backup vocals. And these were not demo recordings as often reported, but more produced tracks. According to the Beach Boys manager, Nick Grillo, around 100 hours were put on tape with about six to eight songs recorded. Session engineer Stephen Desper said that some of the material was pretty good. He had musical talent. Now we don't know what songs were recorded, but we can assume that they were probably a lot of the same songs that appeared on Charles's debut. By pretty much all accounts, the recordings on that release are not the same ones recorded at Brian Wilson's home. I believe the intention was to release these recordings under their label Brother Records based on the fact that Dennis told a UK magazine, the wizard is Charles Manson, who is another friend of mine. He sings, plays, and writes poetry, and may be another artist for Brother Records. Now, Brother Records was the newly formed record label created by the Beach Boys in order to give themselves total creative control over their music. And there was also the idea that each member was encouraged to bring talent they discovered and record them, not unlike the Beatles' Apple Records. In practice, however, only one other group besides the Beach Boys has ever released a full-length album under the label. Also during this time, Charles wrote the song Cease to Exist as a way to heal the differences the Beach Boys were experiencing at this time. The band bought the song, paying Charles some amount of cash along with a motorcycle. When asked why the band didn't give Charles songwriting credit, Dennis said he didn't want that. He wanted money instead. I gave him about $100,000 worth of stuff. Once they bought the song, Dennis changed some of the lyrics and retitled it, Never Learn Not To Love. The band then recorded it in their signature style and released it in December as a B-side to the single, Blue Birds Over The Mountain. The single wasn't exactly a hit, only reaching number 61 on the Billboard chart. This angered Charles though, as he felt if they hadn't have changed his lyrics, the song would have been a hit. Regardless, the song appeared on their 15th studio album 2020. Despite Dennis's best efforts, he didn't get a lot of interest in Charles's music. The only one of note was Terry Melcher, son of Doris Day and producer of some of the bigger hits by the Birds. Terry thought Charles had some talent, but not enough to help him get a recording contract with a major label, but he was interested in recording his music and possibly making a documentary on Charles and the family. But this too fizzled out when Terry witnessed Charles become violent towards a stranger. Gradually, Dennis grew tired of the endless party at his Sunset Boulevard home, and since his lease was set to expire at the beginning of September, he moved out to a beach house a month early in August of 1968. He didn't exactly let Charles know what was going on and left it up to the Beach Boys manager to evict everyone still living there. During their brief time together, it's estimated that Charles and the family cost Dennis over $100,000 in food, clothing, drugs, alcohol, doctor visits, and the wrecking of his expensive cars. His mom said, when they left Dennis's house, Manson or somebody stole Dennis's Ferrari, and they stole everything in the house that could be moved, everything, stripped. Dennis had kicked them out because they were into heavy drugs and he just wanted them out. Despite this though, Dennis and Charles remained in contact. Dennis even helped Charles get more recording time at another studio in early 1969. But even so, their relationship was growing thin. Charles was known to have violent outbursts, even towards Dennis. And on one occasion, he held a hunting knife to Dennis's throat and asked, what would you do if I killed you? 
And during the recording sessions at Brian's home in 1968, Charles was difficult to work with, rarely took direction, and often came to the studio unprepared. Stephen Desper said, what struck me odd was the stare he gave you. It was scary. He pulled a knife on me, just for no reason really, just pulled a knife out and would flash it around while he was talking. Dennis's close friend and songwriting partner Greg Jacobson described their relationship as, Ultimately, Dennis and Charlie went head on because they both had the same energy, only Dennis's was more heart cultured. They attracted each other immediately and then immediately repelled. Then in August of 1969, the infamous Tate LaBianca murders happened and while the police were investigating, Manson and his family were roaming free. Dennis was living in fear because the house where Sharon Tate was murdered was only very recently rented out by Terry Melcher. Dennis thought that maybe the family didn't know he moved out and went there to try to kill Terry for not helping secure a recording contract for Charles, and so Dennis thought he could be next. And his fears were somewhat substantiated because not soon after the murders took place, Manson came by asking for money and threatened to kidnap Dennis's son Scott if he refused. And then another time when Dennis left to play a concert in Canada, Charles stopped by his house asking for him. When he was told that Dennis was out of town, Charles pulled out his gun and took out a bullet, throwing it on the ground and saying something to the extent of, when you see Dennis, tell him this is for him and I've got another one for his son, Scott, too. And it wasn't just Manson he was afraid of, it was the whole family. Dennis would receive threatening phone calls from anonymous members of the family saying he was next and members of the family would break into his house at night and move his furniture. They called it creepy crawling and it was another form of intimidation. It wouldn't be until November when Charles and some members of the family were finally arrested. Years later, Dennis would say, I didn't testify at the trial. I couldn't. I was so scared. By December of 1969, the general public found out about the Manson Beach Boys Association. But even before the news broke, Dennis and everyone else in the Beach Boys circle did their best to distance themselves from Manson. And once the public did find out, it's kind of hard to say if it had a negative impact on the band since their popularity was already in decline, but for Dennis, his involvement with Charles and the family would haunt him for the rest of his life. His health and personal life also suffered as he struggled with addiction and depression. He did his best to distance himself from this experience, but it didn't help that nearly every interviewer would ask him about that time. Dennis would later say he destroyed the tapes and that someday he would write a book explaining his side of the story, but that book never came to be because he tragically died in 1983, drowning in Marina Del Rey. As far as the tapes, I think they still exist in a vault somewhere, as their manager supposedly locked them up soon after the murders. And over the years, people close to the Beach Boys have confirmed their existence. In a 1971 Rolling Stone article, an anonymous member of the Beach Boys said, We've got several 8-track tapes of Charlie and the girls that Dennis cut. In 1997, Bill Scallion Murphy said, in the vaults, there exists an 8-track finish master by Charlie Manson that features Carl and Dennis and was produced by them. At this point, I doubt we'll ever hear these recordings, at least not while there are members of the Beach Boys still alive. And honestly, that's probably for the best. I doubt they would sound anything like classic Beach Boys harmonies over Charlie's singing. If anything, they probably sound slightly better than what's already been released on his debut. And that is the crazy yet true story of how the Beach Boys collaborated with Charles Manson. Let me know what you think of this whole thing with a comment down below. Have you heard of this story before or was this new to you? Do you think the tape should be released at some point? I'm curious to know. Also, if you haven't already, do me a favor and check out some of the solo work by Dennis Wilson. It is excellent music and you will not regret it and it's a shame we never got more of it. Until then, I want to thank you all so much for watching, but I especially want to thank my members over on Patreon. I'm your Vinyl Geek, and I'll catch you on the flip side.